you're redeemed. You're redeemed. By the blood of Jesus, we are redeemed. Come on, give God some praise. Some of y'all ain't even standing up right now. God said you're redeemed. You, you shouldn't even be here, some of y'all, but God redeemed you. Woo! Man, that song's anointed. Praise God. All right, y'all can be seated. Welcome to the 11 a.m. service. My name is Gavin Tate. Hello. All right. Let me get into the word today. You got your Bible? Five people. That's great. Okay. Second, Second Kings 9, 16 through 24 and verse 27. We're going to begin reading. Before I read, I want to say a couple of pre-statements. Number one, this word today is for the planted people in the house. You see, Psalm 92 says those who are planted in the house of their God, the courts will flourish in the courts of their king. Flourish means they'll be blessed. Everything they touch will be blessed. This is for planted people. Now, here's the deal. Every single one of y'all, I'm praying God touches you for what we're going to say today. However, what is, I'm going to preach today is a prophetic word that is over the church. This is a prophetic word that's over the church, and this is how it works. If you want to partake of the anointing that's over the house, you have to plant yourself in the house. It's not just for anybody who visits the house. It's for people who are planted to the vision of the house. So biblically, there's three ways you get planted. Number one, you're planted in vision. The house's vision becomes your vision. Number two, you're planted in time. You serve the house with your time. And number three, you are planted financially. You have given over your uh, tithes and offerings to the house of God because you're not giving to man, you're giving it to God. Okay, if you're in that boat, this is for you because the anointing that is on the Wayroad Outreach is about to come on your families. This isn't a message for you. Please be listening carefully. So the planted people are about to get a message. Let me say about prophetic message. This is really important. Not every single message is a prophetic message. Yes, the Bible in itself is prophetic in nature, for sure. It all applies to us. It all applies to something we need to become. We are constantly becoming what the Word already says we are. Do you understand that? You might not be some things that God says you are yet, but you are always in the process of becoming something. In Jesus' name, you are becoming what God called you to be, not what the devil calls you to be. Okay? He does leave that choice up to us. You don't automatically become what God wants unless you choose to be what God wants. Okay? But a prophetic message never works. The Bible says that Jesus came and he said they received the word, but they benefited nothing from it because they did not mix it with faith. So you must hear the word... And then mix it with faith for it to profit you. You have to actually in your heart as you're listening to these words, God will be speaking things that you know that you need. But it's not enough for you just to hear them. You have to expect God because I'm in this house today, because I am planted in this church, that anointing that he's saying will touch my family. You have to know it's going to happen. You have to believe it's going to happen. And you have to expect something's about to change. That's a prophetic word. Does there anybody in this place have faith? Faith. Because let me tell you, the word will go out, and if it's not mixed with faith, it falls to the ground in your life. It doesn't mean that God's word ever falls to the ground. It means in your life it will not bear the fruit. Because think about it this way. The word is the seed. Your faith waters it. So expectation is the highest level of faith. Expectation is saying, before I even hear it, I know you're doing it. Before it, I even know what to do yet, I know you're already working. Before I'm even doing everything perfect, God, you're always working behind the scenes. Philippians 2.13. God is working within you, giving you the desire and the power to follow through to please him. Some of y'all had a lot of desire, but you need the follow through. Every one of you, man, I want to serve God, man, I want to have this. But you need follow through. God is giving you the power to both desire what he wants you to desire and giving you the follow through, okay? So here we go. 2 Kings chapter 9, 16 through 24. Then Jehu got into a chariot, 
rode to Jezreel to find King Joram, who was lying there wounded. King Ahaziah of Judah was there too, for he had gone to visit him. The watchman on the tower of Jezreel saw Jehu and his company approaching, so he shouted to Joram, I see a company of troops coming. They're approaching. Send out a rider to ask if they are coming in peace. King Joram ordered, so a horseman went out to meet Jehu and said, The king wants to know if you are coming in peace. Jehu replied, What do you know about peace? Fall in behind me. The watchman called out to the king, um, The messenger you sent out, he's not returning. Uh, so the king sent out a second horseman. He rode up to them and said, The king wants to know. Do you come in peace? Again, Jehu answered, What do you know about peace? Fall in behind me. The watchman exclaimed, um, That messenger's not coming back either. So uh, he says, Quick, get my chariot ready, King Joram commanded. Then King Joram himself, he sent two messengers. They're both now no longer his messengers. But now he's like, I'm going myself. So the king Joram of Israel, king of Isaiah, rode out in the chariot to meet Jehu. They met him on the plot of land, and this is what they said. He demanded, do you come in peace, Jehu? Jehu replied, how can there be peace as long as idolatry and witchcraft of your mother Jezebel are all around us? Then king Joram turned the horses around fled shouting treason at Isaiah but Jehu drew his bow and shot Joram between the shoulders the arrow pierced his heart and he sank down dead on his chariot my God when King Isaiah of Judah saw what was happening he fled along the road Jehu rode after him shouting shoot him too so they shot Isaiah in his chariot near Eblium he was able to go as far as Megiddo but he died there one more scripture Deuteronomy 1, 6 through 8, Moses is speaking and he says these words. When we were out Mount Sinai, the Lord our God said to us, you have stayed on this mountain long enough. It's time to break camp and move on. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time for you to move on. Turn to your other neighbor. It's time for you to move on. Go to the hill country of the Amorites and the Jebusites. Later on in the scripture, look what he says. I'm giving you this land. Go in and occupy it. For this is the land I swore to give your ancestors. This is your promise. I gave you the promise, but you don't have it yet. Listen, I'm giving you the promise. All the land belongs to you, but I'm not going to take it for you. I gave you all of this already. You know what the promise is. You know the vision I gave you. You know what I told you about your family. You know that every single one of them is going to be saved. Didn't I tell you that? Didn't I tell you that all your, you're going to get breakthrough? Don't you know this? This addiction's only a matter of time. I'm with you. Don't you know who I am? I'm God. I fling the stars into place. I, I breathe out and... Is there any other God who looked at nothing, Job said, literally looked at nothing. There's nothing right here. I'm waving my hand. There's nothing here that you and I could see. But he said he took the world and he hung it on the nothing. Who else but God can see nothing and it's so something that the world can hang on it? Who else but God? He's saying, I gave you the promise, but I leave a part for you to do. I need you to go in and drive out everybody who's on the land I gave you. I need you to possess something. I don't just need you to claim stuff. I don't just need you to sit back, but do nothing about the things I've given you. I'm asking there to be a church who will no longer just listen to the promises and cry when they're in church, but they go home and they start possessing on their knees. They start possessing with the word. They start possessing. You've been on this mountain long enough. You've been in this place of fear long enough. You've been intimidated by the members of your family long enough. You've been under a spirit of terror long enough. 
You've been having nightmares, a cycle of it for years and years, and you're doing nothing about it. You're just thinking you deserve it. You're just letting it happen. You're allowing the enemy to take over your kid's life long enough. You've been in this place, you've been doing the same cycles of temptation, falling, and then you fall again, and then you fall again. It's the same sin you fell to when you were 12. Some of y'all started it at 12, and now you're 50, and you still got it. God gave you the promise, but you haven't taken it. I gave you the land, Joshua, but you got to get in there because there's people who are sitting on what belongs to you. Are you going to let them stay there or are you going to possess? You've been on this mountain long enough. You've been in this addiction long enough. I think it's time you get a victory. I think it's time you get a victory. I think it's time you get a victory. It's time you get a breakthrough. Jehu is there writing, and he's saying this incredible scene. Listen what happens. A messenger is sent out from the enemy's camp. And the messenger is one of the top leaders of the enemy's camp. Hear my words. He comes and has one conversation with a man who has a takeover anointing on his life. He comes in with one man who has a takeover anointing on his life. And in the span of one conversation, he's recruited from one of the top leaders of the enemy's camp to now he's a follower of God in one conversation. You see, God has an anointing he's putting on this church. Well, they will go out and you will go to the number one hitman of the enemy. And within one confrontation with you, they will turn from the enemy's recruit and they will turn to God's recruit. Get behind me. They've been going, they've been full on for the devil. I'm talking gang leaders. This is already happening in our churches. This is happening. Gang leaders, bike leaders, people, full on hitmen for the enemy. God targets them. They come to the way. There's an anointing of a takeover that's over the house. And the same people that were the leaders for those crews are now repping all the same things for Jesus with full authority. I preached this message in Arizona, in Safford. And if you go to Safford, Arizona with Pastor Robert and everybody over there, it's Mormonism everywhere. There's Mormon temples. They're all over the place, all over the city. God gave me this message before I even arrived. I don't, I didn't, because I preached there before, but I totally forgot about all the Mormon temples and everything. But I knew this was the message I was supposed to preach. So I go in there and I'm driving through the city with Robert. I'm like, oh, okay, I see what's going on. I see why I'm supposed to say this now. I told him, I said, Pastor Robert, it's what I'm going to preach. He said, oh, oh man, preach this. I go into the church and I say, listen, and I told him this story, the story I'm about to tell you. It says that God, that the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant. They stole it, which represents the presence of God. They stole it from the, from the Israelites. They take it into a temple, and Dagon, the god Dagon, the idol, is standing there. Dagon had multi-breasts because he represented a sexual idol. They would do orgies in front of Dagon, and they would sacrifice their children to Dagon. So look at this. They put the Ark of the Covenant in the same room as Dagon. They shut off the lights, they leave, they come the next morning, and Dagon is on his face in front of the Ark of God. But they're like, you know what, maybe, um, maybe just somebody came and tipped it over accidentally at night and they forgot to pick it back up. So they pick it back up, the next morning they come, not only is Dagon on his face, his head is cut off and his hands are broken. Because the head represents the authority in the Bible, and the hands represent the work that the enemy did. You see, you cannot have the presence of God in one place. It will not share space with any other God. It will not share space with any other gods. It will not share space with idols. It will not share space with any gods of the region. I told this to the church in Safford, and I'm telling you, they were silent, and I said this. I said, I just want you to know every temple, every Mormon is a place that's around here. You guys, by being here, are taking over the atmosphere. You're shocking the system. And every God that's here is about to bow down. Every knee will bow. Every tongue is going to confess. 
It won't share space with your idols. God will not share space with your idols. These people, these people, half of them were shouting, half of them were scared spitless. And I didn't know why until after the service. I was like, man, I think, I, I, I was like, man, I got it. But I was like, they all received it, but something's going on here. I talked to Pastor Robert. I said, what's going on? He said, look at this. And we went out to the front of the church. People from the Mormon churches were there in the front of the church finding their people who left the Mormon church and have already come. And they're sitting there like, what are you doing here? They're out like, get back. Come, come on. Like they're out in the front, like, what are you doing here? Why would you ever come to this church? Blah, blah, blah. They're doing all this in the front, and I'm just sitting there, and Robert and I are laughing. We're just like, you see this? One of the women who's there who now does the adopt the block for the whole time over there, over there, she was a Mormon, completely got out of it. Her family's still there. They excommunicated her so much that they changed the locks on their doors to their houses. She can't even visit her mom or her family, her dad, nobody. Pastor Robert comes, he says, you're our family now. Come to the way. You're with us. We'll take care of you. Come and take over. Come on. Come on. You got it right here. We're right here. Do you understand that we're about to possibly be given 69, I think it was, village churches or something in Africa? Do you understand that we just got a building that we're about to do with Pomona with all these people? We're going to take over that entire region. Do you understand that literally since I've been here, I've been here for almost nine months. Since I've been here, almost every month, Pastor Marco's talking about another church that wants to be given to us. Why is this? Why? 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 Because God doesn't wait. When you have a takeover anointing, he doesn't even wait till you get there. He already knows he can trust you. So he sends things. He sends families. He sends churches. You need this for your family. But here's the deal. Some of y'all have given in to intimidation. You see, if I were to talk about Jehu, I would not be doing it justice if I didn't talk about Elijah. Elijah, you might know him, great famous prophet. You know, he's the one who was so bold that he calls out 450 prophets of Baal. He says, meet me on top of a mountain. Let's have a showdown. One verse 450. They come up there. They start trying to worship their God Baal. They're cutting themselves. And Elijah's over there. He's so bold. He's so unafraid, unintimidated, that he's making fun of them. While they're trying to worship Baal, they literally try all day long. And he's like, Baal must be on the toilet right now. I mean, see what the Bible says. Is he relieving himself? I mean, yeah, he's making, he's mocking them. And then he's like, let's stop all of this. You guys had 24 hours. Give me five minutes. He says, drench this altar. Seven different times they drench it. And the fire of God comes the moment one man calls on him. Licks it down. Not only does that happen, he takes all 450 prophets down to the river and cuts them to pieces with the sword. Sends it all down the river and said, this is what will happen to any other person who worships any other God here. Because I'm a takeover man. He's the same man that when they would try to come and arrest him, fire would fall on people literally out of heaven. Just consume them. Finally, the third soldier comes up and he says, listen, um, I just don't want to die. Please, I'm just trying to do what my master said. Can you please? That's, that's Elijah. But listen, this same man gets a letter from a crazy woman named Jezebel. And even though he defeated 450 prophets, one woman, she wrote a letter and it scared him so bad he runs for his life. And he's so scared, he wants to die. He's in the desert, literally begging God to kill him. And an angel has to come and feed him and pick him up. And an angel, because he's like, just kill me, just kill me. And then he wants to go to sleep. You know why? Because when you don't, don't want to deal with your problems, you know what you do? You take a nap. It's a way of escape. I don't want to deal with what's going on in my life right now. I'm just going to go to bed. He says, get up. He takes him to a cave, and then we know the story. The fire comes, but the voice of God wasn't in the fire. The thunder comes, the earthquake, but the voice of God wasn't in the earthquake. Lightning comes, the voice of God not Then a still, small voice. And he says, that's my God. I know my God's voice. Realize, Elijah hasn't heard God's voice in over 40 days. The first sentence God says is this. What are you doing here? 
I told you to take over and get rid of that woman. And you have run for your life. You gave it to intimidation. Now he says two things. One, I need you to walk every single step you took in fear. I need you to take, the Bible says, take the same route you took to get here. I need you to take every single step back in faith. Every step you took in 40 days in fear. I need you to take every single step back in faith. Some of y'all need to hear this. I don't know when the moment was that you were traumatized. I don't know who spoke to you. I don't know in your family what happened. I don't know what's going on. But you have been under the spirit of intimidation. And God needs you to go back to every memory, every single place, and say, I reclaim in Jesus' name. That's no longer a part of me. I will not receive this. I... He says, I'm not going to let you. You got to take every step you took in fear. You're my prophet. You're going to take it back in faith. But he says, unfortunately... I need you to go anoint two people, Elisha and a man named Jehu, to take your place. He got replaced because he gave into the spirit of intimidation. You see, please understand something. God loves you. He has a purpose for you. He's merciful. We don't know how big his patience is. Isn't it overwhelming? Isn't it amazing? Uh, absolutely. Nobody could measure that stuff. And it is up to God. He'll show mercy to who he shows mercy. He won't to what? That is up to God. However, there is a timeline that God is on. And if you don't do it, he will give it to somebody else and they'll do it. Because they're willing to obey. Don't ever underestimate the timing of your life right now. Can God restore? Absolutely. Is it too late? Absolutely not. The fact that you're in this building is telling you it's not too late. The fact that you're listening to this message is saying that God's ready to move. He's ready to recover. He's ready to restore. But you got to choose to possess this thing. You can't just go home a, a member of the Wayroad Outreach. You got to go home a family that has the takeover anointing. You know why? Because the takeover anointing will call in every one of your lost family members. It's going to take over their life. Every time they hug you, they come in contact with the takeover anointing. Every time they have a meal at your house, they come in contact with the takeover anointing. Every single time that you go to their bedroom, they come in contact. You go in your child's bedroom, they're having nightmares, they come in contact with the takeover anointing. You see, I tell this to families all the time. Parents are coming up, you know, oh, this is going on, and this demon, I think, and I think it might possibly be this one and all that. I'm like, listen. I'm like, okay, you could try to discover all the 77 demons that might be in the left room and then the dining room and then the two under the rock over here and all that. Of course, I believe in all of it. However, instead of, like, holding the weight all on you, my question I always ask them is, well, is the presence of God the center of your home? Because please realize this, the Bible says that when they took the Ark of the Covenant, they stole it, David got it back. So he gets it back and it's on its way back. And the Bible says that it's on a cart and it's shaken. And a man named Uzzah reaches out and takes the Ark so it won't fall off of the cart. The moment he touches it, he dies. Because no man can control what God wants to do. If you try to put your hand on what God wants to do, if you try to form it to your own desires, form it to your own will, it ain't going to work. So David gets scared. He's like, oh my gosh, I can't have this thing around me. I might die. So he puts it in the home of Obed-Edom for three months. And the Bible says for three months, everything Obed-Edom said was blessed. His children were blessed. Uh, his business was blessed. Everything that he ever did and he touched was completely blessed, overwhelmingly blessed for three months. David hears about how blessed he is and he's like, man, I'm going down to get that thing. That man can't just have all the blessing. He was afraid for three months, but when he was hearing about all the blessing, he's like, man, I got to go get that thing. And he comes back. It's amazing. And it said that when David got it back, it said that he took, listen, he took seven steps. And every seven steps, he would dance out of praise. He would love all the way back in. It's a whole message in itself. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Build an altar. Let's praise God. Next one, one, two, you see every single step along the journey, you better be praising God. You better be praising God. Did you have a phone call? Did your father call you up and say, I just want to apologize? You got to praise God for that. Did your child come and say, I came to youth conference? You better praise God for that. You got to be praising God for everything that's going the whole time. 
So he brought it back. But listen, when the presence of God was the center of your home, you can either try to fight and find everything yourself, or you can just make the presence of God the priority of your home. And you know what it's like? God showed me. He said it's like mosquito repellent, Gavin. You put mosquito repellent on, and the mosquitoes come, but they bounce off. You just don't notice them. You know what? I got to be honest with y'all. I came to this church, like I said, about nine months ago. Ashley and I, my wife, and my son, Max. And for the first, like, three or four months, I can't tell you how many Facebook messages I got. <laughs> and texts, and you know what people are saying? We know that you're going through so much warfare right now. <laughs> Serious, from people in the church. Might have been you. We're going through so much warfare right now. I know that, I know that you must be just dealing with so much, you know, you know, but we just want you to know we're praying for you, and it's going to be all right. <laughs> I call Ashley. I'm like, hey, babe, uh, come here. Have you noticed, like, tons of warfare? Like, you having, like, issues, nightmares? I don't, I don't know what's going on with all this warfare. Like, I called my dad on the phone. I said, supposedly there's all this warfare that's going on. I ain't noticed none of it. He said, son. <laughs> He said, son, it's because you made the presence of God a priority with your life. He said, because you're too busy doing the vision, son. You ain't got no time to notice whatever's going on. You see, you can't put down. My mother preached it on Mother's Day. You can't put down your tool and come off of the wall to build to pay attention to nonsense. Sure, maybe uh, you know, attacks are coming, but I don't notice them. I'm too busy in God's presence. I'm too busy being chased by the blessing. I'm too busy. I can't even hide from it anymore. I can't hide from the blessing. Surely goodness and mercy is going to attack me all the day. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I can't, I can't hide. Man, the moment I start trying to feel depressed, five people will call me and say how amazing God's using me. Moment I start feeling terrible, my son will come in the room, jump on me, and hug me, and I start weeping. God always has a way. He's always got a way to keep you encouraged as long as you make his presence priority. He'll have a way. Man, there's an anointing in this room right now. Take over anointing. Last thing. Hallelujah. You see, please, Chris, come on out and play. I want to tell you what he told Joshua. He said, listen. He said, there's going to be seven different tribes. Ites. And he said, you're going to have to drive all of these out. These are the ones that are sitting on your land. They're the ones who are sitting on what belongs to you. Are you going to drive them out? You're going to have to drive them out one by one. Every person, please close their eyes right now. This is a moment where the Holy Spirit's about to move. Thank you. The first one was the Hittites. This is a ruling spirit. Hittites mean this, the ruling spirit of terror, fear, or phobias. If you right now have been intimidated, you have terror, you're being ruled by fears or phobias right now, and you're tired of them, I need you to stand to your feet right now. Right now, if you're fighting this right now, toward your family, intimidation from family members, fear from family right now, you've been threatened, you literally have terror. Maybe there's been traumatic instances that have happened. Lift your hands if you're standing right now. Turn up that piano, please. I'm going to pray for you right now to drive this thing out. This is ministry time. You belong to this house. There is an anointing on this house to take over. Your family belongs in this house. Your sons belong in this house. You have an anointing that's on you. Because you have planted a seed in this house, because you're dedicated to this vision, this doesn't happen for everybody. But 
God has moved in such a beautiful way in this season for this house. It's going to come over your family. You don't need to be afraid anymore. God is going to fight your battles. He's already been fighting. Lift your hands and receive right now your freedom. In the name of Jesus, I'm praying God right now. Now I need you to praise him out loud. The Bible says put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You need to release yourself from fear. Do not fear any man, for the Bible says fearing man is a snare. It is a trap. God is waging war for you. He's fighting you. You will be protected. This is a prayer of protection, power that's coming over you, over your sons, over your daughters right now. I need you to praise him out loud. I thank you, God. I just thank you, Lord, right now. If you're standing up, come on, praise him. Just, Lord, I just thank you, God. Just tell him, I thank you, Lord. I need you, God. I thank you, Jesus, you're doing this right now. See, you got to have faith. you got to mix it with faith. I believe what you're saying. I believe what you're saying right now. Things are being deposited. I see your homes right now. The Spirit of God is going into the room of your children. The nightmares are ending. I'm seeing the Spirit of God going into your houses. God is moving for you. He's moving in ways you can't do. He's having conversations with your family you can't even have. He's already working on hearts hallelujah Jesus come on cry out for your family your mother your father you need help if you're intimidated by them joy Jesus I give over my fear we drive it out we drive it out we drive it out it doesn't belong on my land anymore fear does not belong there it's occupying my space it's occupying my promise Take it out. children will be in this house your brother will be in this house your sister will be in this house your mother's gonna be in this house we come in and we take over God right now in agreement with Pastor Marco and the whole staff of this church we take over God right now these lives we take over we agree the power of God comes in we agree God we take our stake in the sand I know the anointing's strong, but please be seated. Stay in that anointing right now. Just keep worshiping God. Number two, the Gergeshites. This is feeling foreign. This is a feeling of never fitting in. It's a lack of belonging. Stand up right now. You're like, my God, I'm in my family, but I've never fit with my family. I don't, I don't know. I, I'm in this church. I know once I'm here, I'm part of the family. But there's something that's keeping me. I just can't let the acceptance. I can't let people love me. I can't accept love. I'm having such a hard time receiving love. Come on, stand up. I know people are telling me, but there's something that's blocking me. You need to drive this thing out. You belong with Jesus. You belong in God's house. You have a part to play. You are important. You are relevant right now. I don't care what you've done that makes you feel like you're worth nothing. Jesus never changes the opinion of you because of your mistakes. Put your hands up right now. If you're sitting in your seat, stretch your hands out to one of these people that are standing. Let's pray right now. They need the spirit. There's a spirit of an orphan that literally comes on people. They can be among people, but they still feel alone. It's really, it's something. No more. No more. Right now, be set free. Be delivered right now. You belong, receive God's love. Receive his love. There it is. I'm seeing people right now. Just let the breakthrough happen. Let the breakthrough happen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. You belong with God. Come on, I know you've been abandoned, but not by Jesus. I know somebody's turned away, but not by Jesus.
sit down under the presence of God. I know you're receiving. Come on, stay in that mount. Stay in that place. There's the Amorites. Evil speaking. Negative thoughts. Your mind is going crazy. It literally represents evil speaking thoughts. You're claiming things for your own self that God did not tell you. You're saying on this, God didn't call you that. You're saying this will always be that way. God didn't call you that. These are people who need some serious deliverance of their mouth. Stand up. You need deliverance of your mouth. You're agreeing with the enemy's lies. You're speaking death. Your thoughts are convinced of something that is a lie. It is not true. Put your hands up in the air. God is already beginning to move. I need you to pray right now. Use that mouth now to pray in the Holy Ghost or to thank God. Wash out your mouth. God's supernaturally doing it right now. He's touching your mouth. You're not going to be a gossip anymore. You're not going to be someone who speaks lies anymore. You're not going to be speaking death. You're speaking life. There you go. Touch their mouth with a hot coal, God, just like you said you would. My God, so much is happening right now in this room right now. I got, if I could just describe to you what I'm seeing. I'm seeing releases over here, releases over here. There are curses that are generational that are breaking right now. I'm seeing them literally happening in front of my eyes. The takeover anointing is here. Canaanites, this is slave mentality. This is a poverty mentality. This is low self-esteem. This is you saying it's never going to work for me. It works for other people. I just can't be a success. I just, it's just not going to work. I've always tried. It hasn't happened. You're a slave. You're a slave to your past experiences and circumstances. Stand up. Stand up. You're tired of being this way. Look at this. Put your hands in the air. God is depositing wealth. His promises. They're for you. They're not just for the person to your left or the person to your right. They're for everybody. If you are planted in this house, whew, come on, pray. Thank him for touching you. Thank him that he's giving this to you right now. You're in this atmosphere. By being in this atmosphere, you're partaking of what we're getting right now. It's not passing you over. It's not going beside you. It's right here. It's right here. Expect it. Faith pulls it from the atmosphere. Listen, faith pulls it from the atmosphere. There's the parasites. Parasites mean this, lack of discipline, lack of self-control. If you find you just fall way too easily, it's like, man, I'm not even putting up a fight anymore. I have a lack of self-control. God has given you things and he's told you plans to do, maybe for your health, maybe for your diet, maybe for things with you, but you just do not get to it. You procrastinate, you don't do it. Stand up. Come on, there you go. There's some honest people in here. If you're bold with honesty with God, he'll be bold with you. If you're bold with the Lord, he'll be bold with you. Put your hands in the air. You need to drive this thing out. It's wasting your time. This procrastination is wasting your time. This lack of self-discipline, the Bible says in Proverbs, a man or woman who has no self-discipline is like a wall that has been broken down. The enemy can come in anytime he wants. He comes in, he goes out. He's having his run in your life. It's time for it to end. Come on, pray. God, give me the power. Give me the fruit. Help me develop the fruit of the spirit called self-control, self-discipline. Come on, ask him. Help me, God. Develop this fruit in me. Holy Spirit, I know you're the one who does it. I need your strength. I don't want to keep procrastinating. I want God to do what you're telling me to do. I need this. There's only two more. Hivites means limited vision, limited thinking, and a limited life. Limited vision, limited thinking leads to a limited life. That's the Hivites. you got to drive this thing out. If you say, you know what, I don't, I'm not clear. I don't know where my vision's going. Stand up. I have no idea. I just, I just, I'm just running. You, know, I, you wake up every day and you're like, you know, today's just going to happen. You don't have a vision right now. There's a vision in this house right now. There's a vision in this house. Get on the vision. Put your hands up right now. Oh, 
Hallelujah. God's giving vision to you. He's giving clarity. He's telling you where you need to be. You got to take authority over this thing right now. I will not wake up not knowing what my purpose. I will wake up with a purpose. I will wake up with a vision. God's given it to me. I take the vision of the house, and God, I'm trusting you that you'll tell me everything I need to know. That's what you say. God, I'm taking up the vision of this house, and I'm trusting you that you will lead me every step for what I'm supposed to do with my personal life. As I serve the vision of the house, you're giving me my vision. As I serve the vision of the house, you're giving me my vision. Last one is the Jebusites. This one... I don't know if there's going to be any honest people, but I'm praying there will be. It means entitlement, a self-righteous, prideful spirit. Some of y'all are like, well, at least I don't do what they do. At least I'm not one of those. I don't have to stand for that. If you've been self-righteous, entitled, prideful, don't you know that without God you would be nothing? I need you to stand up. You need to repent of this right now. You need to drive this thing out. It's a religious spirit. It is self-righteous. It is occupying the place of your freedom. Lift your hands. Come on, be free right here. Be free. Be free. Take over anointing saying you're going to be free. It's in this house. You're under an atmosphere. You can't do whatever you want in here, devil. This is not your place. The presence of God is here. Every knee will bow. I tell you to bow. Release them. Release them. Release them. Release them. Come out. In the name of Jesus. I free. In the name of Jesus. That is taking over. Your fears are gone right now. Terrors are fleeing this building. That prideful, self-righteous spirit fleeing this building. Let it go. Repent right now so God can free you. It is taking space that belongs to God. Self-discipline, laziness. God, right now, I just take out that spirit of lethargy right now. You've been tired for too long. Some of y'all wake up tired. You walk around tired. You go to sleep tired. You're just tired. Be set free in Jesus' name. You have no energy. Energy is coming to you right now. <laughs> praise him with your mouth right now. Thank him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, just praise him right now. Just thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Every person who's under the sound of my voice, close your eyes, please. Do you know Jesus? Don't move right now. This is such a precious point of God right now. You can feel his spirit here. Don't grieve him. Do you know Jesus? Have you made him the Lord of your life? This church is all about souls. This house is a family for you. Do you even know the God we've been talking about? Do you have peace with God? Can I ask you that? Do you have peace with God? If you say, man, I don't want to wait one more second, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm going to ask you to just start walking right now. If you say, I want Jesus, get up here. Start walking right now. Start walking right now. Here they come. Here they come. I need Jesus. I want to know him. I want to have peace with God. Come on. Here they come. Come on. Everywhere from the left to the right. Don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. Come on. Come on. Just receive him. He's your savior. He's your Lord. Come on, he's here for you. Look at these men coming up right here. Come on, give them a hand. These people belong. These people are important to Jesus. They're still coming from the back. Come on. Come on, they're still coming. They're still coming. You're welcome here. This is your family. This is a home for you. Come under this right now. We want to love you. Oh, this whole family's coming up right here. Come on now, give my hand. We got sons and daughters. We got sons and fathers coming up. We got husband and wives coming up. We got people who are taking a stand saying that's for me and my house. Guys, 
They're going to talk with you in just a moment. They're going to tell you, take you, uh, tell you your next step. It's called starting up the way. They're going to help you get baptized and all that. But please, let's say one prayer all together out loud. Everybody in this building, say, Dear Lord Jesus. Make sure you say it. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. Thank you for washing me with your blood. Thank you, God, that you have forgiven me. I will never be the same. Now, Lord, I help me forgive myself. Help me forgive myself. He's giving you the power to do that right now. Say, in Jesus' name, I make you my boss. I will be a disciple. I will become a disciple. I'm going to take the next step. I'm serious about my walk with you. Lord, thank you for becoming my friend, my master, my Lord. Show me who you are in Jesus' name. Give everybody a hand. Give everybody a hand. Give everybody a hand. Come on. Welcome new family members into the house of God. Welcome new family members into the house of God. Now listen, these people are going to pray with you. Don't leave yet. Let them give you something. Guys, the way has got talents tonight. We'll see you. Please come out and support. It's going to be a great time. Wednesday night as well is going to be incredible. At 6 o'clock tonight is the way has got talent right here. We love you. God bless.